Because it will, even if you love the game, you do it every weekend, every single day, it will catch up to you. And since he is my first dog, I've been just trying to get everything I can for him. Like I could do without the trophy, but I just like having that title for him. And I think it's only happened like one time where the dog deer did win nationals. It's a rarity, but it's not impossible either. Last year, I was kind of hoping, I was like, well, maybe this will be the number two dog that does it. But you know, we never, we didn't get lucky enough for that. You try to prepare for every situation you can think of. Safety birds, mismark birds, birds that won't fly. But you try to prepare as much as you can for every scenario. It just, you have today is good fun, good people, and good dogs. It's something that I can't see myself being out of. Welcome back to another episode presented by Standing Stone Supply. Joined with me this week is Lauren Trout. Lauren, how you doing, buddy? I'm good. How are you? Pretty good. So uh, we're, we have you on this week. We're going to talk about you're one of the uh, top two point leader in the UFTA standings right now. And anybody that's been listening to the podcast for a little bit, they know that I've been kind of getting involved in UFTA, trying my hand, ultimately getting my butt kicked so far. But uh, throughout the process, it's kind of neat picking the brains of, of guys such as yourself that have been doing it for a while. And, and this is something that you really enjoy doing and you, you've been involved with it pretty much your entire life, if, if I remember correctly. Uh, so right, we're going to kind of just cover your, your background and, and why you like UFTA, what, what it's appealing to. Uh, to you about it and and pretty much what the whole point race is and what it means to you. But let's go ahead and start off. Introduce yourself. Tell everybody where you live and and what kind of dogs you run and all that fun stuff. Um, I'm Lauren Trout. I'm from pretty much central Kentucky, Elizabethtown, Kentucky. Uh, I run German short air pointers. I actually just got my second one uh, about two weeks ago. I've had my first one for five years now and decided to go ahead and get another one. So when did you decide that you wanted to get a German short hair? Like, like we just said, I think you've been involved in this uh, for a long while because of your grandfather. Is that right? Right. Um, we've always had short hairs. So it's kind of like, didn't really have, I don't want to say I don't really have an option, but that's what we've always had. That's what I knew. That's what I went with, had a short hair. And I've actually been looking into getting a pointer here soon eventually too okay uh, but they just i mean for the game we play short hair is i mean a very useful dog in this game yeah so how long what's what's the first time that you remember going to a ufta event i think i was like 10 or 11 years old uh, i got pulled out of school on like a friday so automatically i wanted to go obviously <laughs> right uh, so I go to this trial and as a kid, I was a very shy person. Like I didn't, I wouldn't talk to anybody. I was type to hide behind somebody so I could avoid talking to them. And when I got to the trial, I just met all these people that were nice. I could easily talk to them. You know, they took me in really easily and I just got to know more people. It actually opened me up more getting into the UFTA, made me more vocal, getting, being more social and not being as shy around people. Mm. And so your first event that you can recall was around 10. And, and how old are you now? 23. 23. So you've been involved for 13 years, so the better part of a yeah. of a decade. You, you started attending just as a way to kind of get out of school. When did you start competing or at least running the dog? Did you get to do that like around, you know, teenage years at all? So we would have these fun trials at like in E-Town, Elizabethtown, and for like youth – people my age when I was like 13, 14 ish. Uh, but I wasn't actually running in trials for very long. After that, I started actually planting birds, actually working at the trials. So I did that for about three years. And then I think 2018, 2017, I started work actually running dogs in UFTA. Mm. And I didn't have my own dog. I actually started running this dog that my grandfather had named Fancy. And I kind of ruined her, to be honest. That was my <laughs> fault. Uh, now, hold on. You you, ru you ruined her in the competition or actually, like, ruined her training? Like, did he give you, like, a, a finished dog and said, here, go have fun, and then you ended up ruining her? Yeah, she was, she was pretty much finished. She'd been force broken. 
I got to where I was shooting birds a little too hard. <laughs> like I wasn't, wasn't paying attention how far they were out. I was just there. Shooting. Oh, so you were pillowing so, them. Okay. Yeah. So she got to where she wanted to eat birds and we actually got her out of it. But by, by then she was a little too old. And by that time I decided I wanted my own dog. So I decided <laughs> I got my own dog. <laughs> so your grandpa <laughs> give, gives you this dog that's essentially finished or ready to rock and, and you ruin it. And it's just like, well, yeah. you know, you got the learning curve out of the way so that you can go fix your own dog up. Yeah. Ruin it. You know, here, take this back. <laughs> it's not anymore. Uh, so I got my first dog. I think that was in 2018. I think I got him. I uh, got him from Matt Behe in North Carolina. And I didn't know how to train a dog, how to do anything like that. I think I got him to where he knew his name and knew here, come, whatever. Uh, but I ended up having to send him to Matt to get trained. And when he got back, he knew everything he was supposed to know. I just didn't know everything I was supposed to know. Mm. So he got out of a lot of stuff. And I had to re-bring him back into a lot of stuff he was trained into. And that that was a hard battle for about two years. Mm. So it, that that's a really good point. And, you know, we talk about some people are just better off having a pro trainer take take care of their dog. Right. You know, right. there's some people I, I'm a firm believer that if somebody really wants to train their dog themselves, if they actually will focus and they're intentional enough, I think anybody can do it. Obviously, it comes more natural to some folks right. more th- more so than others. But when you go to a pro trainer, it's not like they they're going to work this dog up, give them back to you. And then you don't have to do anything with them ever again. It's you know, it 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 keeps some pro trainers <laughs> in business right. year after year right. for to get brushing up. But if you if you're gonna send your dog off to a trainer, you you still have to know at least the basics or or the controls, right. if you will. You know, somebody's giving you the keys to a Ferrari, you have to have a driver's license. Exactly. And that's the problem. I he showed me everything I needed to do. I just wasn't doing it because I one either didn't have the time or the ability to get around to do it and or the drive to even do it at the time. Um, but then I got to where honestly I was getting a little embarrassed having being out there. What he would do was instead of, you know, how we have zones, front, middle, back zones, Mm -hmm. he would take off like a rocket as fast as he could to the back of the field. And then you have to walk all the way. He'd be on point, obviously, as soon as he got back there. And that's a long walk to the back of a field as fast as you can. Yeah. So that was a better part of a year and a half trying to get that fixed in general. Yeah. Uh, But it honestly, it made me better having to do all that than just going through it. If I would have worked him as soon as I got him back, I wouldn't have learned as much as I did having to retrain him on all the stuff that I did. Yeah. Well, and I mean, y- y- we all learn from our mistakes more so than our accomplishments. And and anybody listening to this again, you know, UFTA, it, it, it is a it's a time trial and you have three different zones in a field. So just picture a long rectangle field and you're going to have three different zones all kind of evenly spaced out. So it's like you have three grids, if you will, or squares within that rectangle. Right. And uh, so there's, you know that there's one bird planted in each one of those zones. You don't know where in the zone, but that's what, where the dog's supposed to be. So you don't have to go in any particular order of the zone, but what you just described, obviously you don't want to pass up birds to go in the very right. back and then work your way back up. It's not like you get any points by finishing closer to the clubhouse than, right. than the other way. So, uh, so I can see how that could be be frustrating. So did you end up coming out on the other end of this? Like, did you figure out a solution to get him to work the the gate bird in the middle zone before moving back? Like walk me through your, your headset and how you, how we kind of rectified the, the problem. So it got to where, let me think, I think a year, year and a half into this, after this whole problem arose, um, I would work him. I'd put one bird in each zone if I was just working him at home with an e-collar. And that just wasn't working. So it came down to there was a trial we were at up in Illinois, and he could have won it, and it just came down to where I wasn't doing what I was supposed to be doing. And my grandfather gave me the option, either I sell him or I fix him. 
and I wasn't about to fix it or wasn't about to sell him. I'd already made a decision. This is my dog. I'm, I'm keeping him for as long as I am forever. Uh, so I came down to end up asking some of the guys I hunt with uh, advice because a bunch of if you ask people in the UFA for advice on stuff, they'll give you advice on how to work dogs or how to fix a problem. They're not gonna, just going to tell you go on. Yeah, no, I'm not. I'm not helping you with that. Right. Uh, so originally, what they had told me was. You need to let him know that you have where you're at is where the birds are. So I wouldn't put any birds in the field at all. I'd go out with a bird bag with three, four birds in it, and I'd let him just take off wherever he wanted to go. And I'd stand in one spot. And when he'd make his way back to me, I'd throw a bird down right there beside me. And eventually he caught on to where that meant, hey, there's birds here with him. And I only I stayed in the front. I never went past the gate in the front zone when I did that. That worked for about two and a half months till he realized that the bird bag meant I have birds and he wouldn't leave my side when I went out of <laughs> the field. So uh, after that, I just started working where I put birds in the field before I went out, but I didn't put any past the gate. I put two or three in the gate and that's actually helped a lot getting him to stay close and stay in the gate. Um, I might put one in the middle every once in a while, but I stopped putting him in the back and that's, he stopped cutting the back after that. Interesting. That's, that's really reflective of, we talk about stop to flush training on, on previous episodes. And and when you kind of do stuff like that, the dogs get used to the birds coming from your, your hip pocket, your bird bag or, or whatever, if you're throwing birds too much, they're going to get sucked into you, right? Like that, they, they, they get real sticky. They're not going to go out because they, it, it works. They, they associate yeah. you with birds, but at some point you have to kind of extend that out to where it's out in front of them and they're not just seeing, seeing you in the picture with the bird. And that's where, you know, launchers come from. But, you know, I tell everybody, you know, stop to flush is one of the most valuable things I think that you can train your dog up on. Uh, but it, it, does naturally uh, result in stickiness and, and dogs that don't want to leave your side. I mean, it's just, you know, a product of it. You get no, no way to get around that. I've, I've yet to see a dog not get a little sticky or reined in from it. Mm-hmm. So, right. so did that solve your issue by just planning in that zone that he just grew accustomed to it? it you know, he's just like, Oh, well, they're not going to be in the other zones. I'm, I'm curious if you saw any kind of backlash to where, if that did work and you go in the next trial, did he just stay in zone one and not want to go into two and three, or did he follow and stay with you like he should? So, well, there's another thing I also tried. I forgot about this. I just, I remember it now. Um, Before the trial, before he ran, I would keep him in a crate up until right as soon as I ran. And that what it did was it calmed him down to where when I got him out, he was real mellow. He didn't have that energy built up because what what had happened was We'd sit there and watch the run before us, and he gets so worked up from watching that other dog work the field before him that he just wanted to take off as hard as he could. And he would stay in the gate for the most part, but after if he didn't find it after so long, he'd just take off his fat, like he'd leave it. So keeping him in the crate actually kept him, helped out a lot, calming him down. But after a while, it got to where it was getting him too calm. So now... Plus, a lot of it was him being a puppy still. He was still two years old, had a lot of that energy built up. He wanted to burn off. So if he's gotten older, it's gotten a lot better. Yeah. I don't have to keep him in a crate or anything like that. He's, it's, he's a lot calmer now. Yeah. So kind of talk to me about the the point which you guys started just jiving really well. Because, you know, like, like we said, you you compete pretty much almost every weekend somewhere. You're, right. you're in the, the points chase, and we're going to get to that here in a minute. But – Tell me when it started clicking for you guys to where y'all were going out there and not just trying to figure things out, but you guys were competing, you know, week in, week out, and and right. amongst the top ones every weekend where, like, when did he turn into that dog that you can go out and you have confidence that not only can we win it, but, like, that's that's really our goal and, and hope and expectation. Right. So about 2020, let me think, actually 2019, I had shot this gun for two years or so, and he was actually clicking about 2019. 
and I started shooting good with this gun. I couldn't shoot. When I started out, I could not shoot good at all. Like, I, I miss all the time or double shoot one or the other. Uh, so then I started shooting good with it. And then I decided, you know, it's a good idea. Let's change guns so I can re- have, to, have to relearn a new gun. Uh, that was 2019. Get to 2020, I finally learned how to shoot that gun properly. You get it all arranged, and I, it fit me better. And I was working him every single day almost, whether it was one bird or two birds, it didn't matter. If I had 15 minutes of daylight, I found the biggest or whatever field I could find that had some sort of recovery in it around the house. I'd take him to it and just put two, three, one bird out of it, even if I had to do that, and just made sure he got out there on birds and make sure I could at least practice my shooting and everything else. Practice a big thing with safety birds, uh, because I've told some people that if you don't practice safety birds at least half the time, if not more, when you're uh, practicing, then I feel like, in my opinion, you're, you're doing it wrong if you're going to do trials. Explain, because you have to be able to explain what a safety say. bird is for the listeners. Okay. A safety bird is a bird that flies towards the judge or the gallery or another person in another field that you cannot shoot for safety reasons because you would hit somebody, obviously. So when you call safety – that you don't shoot the bird, but you get the points as if you did shoot it. So it's a good bird. Is it almost like you shot it? But what some people have is dogs that that dog, that when that bird flies, that dog chases after it. And if you can break them off of that, that saves you so much time in the long run. Because you can take you 30 seconds to a minute, two minutes getting the dog off a bird. Or it can cost you the whole trial, really. You could spend 15 minutes chasing after the dog. With <laughs> right. I've seen that happen before. And, uh, I just feel, I feel like if you practice safety birds, that's probably, that's one thing you need to practice for if you and, run UFTA. And so when you say practice for a safety bird, ultimately you're talking about a dog in chase and you being able to call them off of it without right. the use of an e-collar because we're in the mid trial. We, we don't have e-collars right. in, in a trial run. So, you know, it, it's like, you can have your your dog steady. You can train your dog up to a, a steady level, but you know, I, I want to get your take on this to the degree of steadiness because some people, you know, you can have your dog steady to shot, steady all the way until release. But when you're talking about a, a time trial, like like we're competing in, you know, time is of the essence, and so. Right. You, you know, most people, I would say, at least from being able to, from watching the few trials that I've been to, everybody's dog is breaking when that dog, when that bird takes flight so that you get that retrieve as fast as possible. And then boom, you're on to the next bird. But when you call safety, if you haven't worked on calling that dog off, it can turn into a cluster real quick. And then if you spend 10 minutes or to your point, 15 minutes getting your dog back because it's chasing a live bird and it's just bouncing all over the place in the woods, you only have 15 minutes in the run. So you pretty much just lost the entire run, even though you got the points because you called a safety, you you still lose out at the end. Right. So I didn't know how to break the, my liver short hair. I have now the five-year-old. I did not know how to break him to shot when I first got him. And now it's kind of a little bit too late. I'm, and now I'll say it works out the way he is. So I ended up just breaking him to where when I say safety or yell safety, he calls off the bird. Mm-hmm. He can chase it. But as soon as he hears safety, he comes off and he's on to the next one. I also had to break him on birds that, wouldn't non-performing birds that wouldn't fly ones that come out five feet in front of him and he has to sit there and watch it walk around that was the biggest i think battle i had to deal with because he he is very bird driven and it was extremely hard to break him off of that um and again it's kind of name of the game because you're dealing with pin raised birds you know covers always questionable you got dirty fields and scent birds and and wind wash birds and all kinds of stuff so when you're dealing with pin raised birds you, you can get a bird that just kind of hops around or walks under the dog. I mean, I, I literally, the uh, two weekends ago, the last time I, I competed, I had two right. birds jump into Rachel's mouth, essentially, because I, I, I was flushing like a, a wild bird to where I'm flushing right. back towards her. And uh, both of those birds, to get away from me, just jumped right in front of her. And I was forced to take that safety, even though I didn't call it, because technically that bird flushed into her mouth. <laughs> so since I've had him, I've learned how to wall break and all the other stuff. So 
I have actually done it to where now if I mess with any dog whatsoever, I try to break them to shot. It makes it so much easier to break them off safety birds and so much easier to break them on birds that non-performing birds that come out right in front of them. It just, it speeds up the process really for that. And it also makes it safer in the field because, you know, some of these dogs that break whenever the bird comes out, the bird can be two feet from their head and you can't shoot it. Yeah. I mean, it, if it's shot and broke the shot, now you do lose a little time on your retrieve, but at the same time, at least you're getting a retrieve. Yeah. If that bird is a little flying bird. Yeah. And, and that's really interesting, you know, since obviously I've, I've, I'm still very new to this game, but there, there's a lot of things that I can see being a strategic benefit. But when you talk about steadiness, like at least in my experience, like I, I really think that overall, if you train for, for this trial and this game and you have the overall efficiency, to your point, if you have steady to shot, something like that to where you lose, you know, I don't know, five seconds on a retrieve. But if you have that quality retrieve to where, yeah, you lost the five seconds on the front end, but, you know, they're not they're not screwing around in the field. They're not, you know, juggling the bird around in their mouth. They're bringing it back, snapping it, heel, handing it to you, and you're off to the races. I think that efficiency is the name of the game, at least in my early experience in this. I don't know if you would agree with that or not. No, absolutely. I'd say if it, the most efficient way you can get by, like going to the back of the field first is definitely not the most efficient way to get by. It's <laughs> right. the least efficient way to get by. But absolutely, I agree. Efficiency is, is the name of the game, to be honest. Yeah. So outside of steadiness, talk to me about like, what is it when – when you say go, so, you know, when, when, people that haven't been to these trials, you're, you're kind of sitting in a blind while the, the bird planter's out there planting the field. Then they come back and the judge says, OK, you know, it, we're ready when you are. And so you release the dog. Talk to me about your mindset going like when you release the dog, what's your strategy? What are you looking for? Do you have an approach or do you just really say hunt them up and let the dog go go do its thing and and you kind of go I, i've seen you in the field so i, I kind of know how you kind of push and pull sometimes <laughs> so, but i, I want to know like what's your thought process when you say go get them and 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 your guys heading to zone one okay so when i started originally when i'd sit in the blind for the first two or three years i'd be shaking just because i was so nervous going out uh, and I've grown out of that lately. I mean, in the past year or so, I've grown out of it. Um, and at first, originally, my idea was, please don't go to the back. Please don't go to the back. But obviously, go to the back. Now, it's more or less, when I get to the line, I'm thinking of, have is this, well, let me backtrack. When I bird planted, bird planted trials originally, and it kind of screws with my head a little bit because I'll start thinking, oh, I'd put a bird over here, and then I get forget it's not me planting. I, there may not be a bird over here. So you can watch the fields and see how they kind of plant throughout the day. So I'll kind of think about, okay, he might have, he's been putting birds over here or birds over here. And most of the time, as long as he's staying in the gate, I'll just let him hunt. Uh, if I know there's a bird somewhere, I'll push him to go to that spot specifically. Other than that, it's just get birds and get out. That, that is my mindset. Yeah. Go as fast as I can and get out. Yeah. And I mean, it's like, to me, it, it I think that everybody's going to have a different approach. Like some guys just come out hot and, and you can't run in the field. Like you can only do like a, a, a high paced a double time walk, if you will, you're, you're going as fast as you can. Essentially like you're a lot of guys are like right there on the edge between yeah. walking and jogging. Right. And, uh, right. some guys just go and, and it's like, they just go in the middle and then they wait for their dog to hit. And then some guys mm -hmm. I see to where they, they start kind of going left and right. They're, they're kind of wiping the field and that's more or less kind of how I've so far tried it out on my end. And, uh, you know, it works to varying degrees. But to your point, like if you if you don't know where the bird's at, it's it's kind of like you're taking a gamble if you go right. one way or the other. And that's what I think that's why a lot of guys kind of stay in the middle of the field and then see if the dogs just kind of go pick it up and play the wind. But I can see how you can kind of get caught up in the uh, overthinking it, if you will, because right. it's like if you if you head all the way to the right, 
wanting to start in that corner and just kind of wipe the mm-hmm. field, you you could lose precious minutes and time on that. But if you take the gamble and, you know, no matter what, there's, there's another way of looking at it, I guess. Right. And that's where at the start, I try not to start off too quick. I'll let him make his little sweep. And if there's a spot, I think there could be a bird and he has a hundred of it. I'll try to get him over from that spot. But if he keeps going back to a spot, I'll just keep trying to get him out of that spot. Yeah. Like sometimes they'll stay in one side of the field and you're like, hunt over here, hunt over here. Yeah. It's, they're on the right side and he'll be on the left side. What about the the trial game? That What about this game overall appeals to you the most? Is it the competition? Is it the camaraderie and teamwork with the dog? You know, it, is it just the – because let's call it – you know, let's just – call it what it is it's just fun like you're just going out yeah. there it's a race against time and and you're just out there shooting up birds and doing it as fast as you can and of course as safely as you can but it's just fun like do you is there one particular thing that you can kind of sum up why you enjoy doing this as much as you do i would definitely say the competition but it's also the camaraderie not with the dogs but also the people so it's not necessarily always at the trial say that it's like a weekend trial like it's cedar creek where we've been before where we go out to eat on like a Saturday night. It's the going out to eat, hanging out with your friends and being there with everybody, you know, and p- to be honest, uh, some of my closest friends are in the UFTA, the people that I talk to the most and that I spend most of my time outside of work or when I have free time with at trials. That's why I do so many trials throughout the years. Cause I actually get to see all these people that I hunt with and, that's why the summer is the hardest time of the year. Cause I mean, it's two, three months, four months. You, you're not seeing anybody, you know, uh, and you try to, I try to keep up with everybody as well. Get on the phone and talk to them. But trial season's definitely the biggest part of or biggest time to see everybody Yeah, as well as run dogs. And I do know, I mean, there's plenty of people that do this trial game, not just UFTA, but kind of any circuit as a way to extend hunting season and, but no matter what, you know, you're in Kentucky, I'm in Tennessee, like you're you're not running trials in freaking July and August. What mm-hmm. are you doing in the off season though? Is that when you're kind of doing some table work, force breaking dogs? You know, what what are you concentrating on with your dogs? Or are you just trying to keep them in shape and and counting down the months until it's time for time to go out there and compete again? So I started force breaking this past summer, and that's all I did throughout the summer as well. I didn't really focus as much uh, on my dog because he was actually hurt throughout the spring. So I kind of let him lay back a little bit and try to get him healed up and let him just rest. Cause the year before, like I said, I worked him every day of the year and I meant every single day. It got to the, like the last week of the trial season. I was like, all right, I'm going to give him a break. That lasted two weeks. And I said, I I can't do this. I got to do something. So I started working him again throughout the summer and I I feel like I might've overworked him a little bit. So I slowed down this year and kind of, I gave him about a two or three month break to kind of heal up and rest and recover. Yeah. Well, and I mean, was that break just as much for you as it was the dog? Cause I mean, you start doing this stuff, like you said, every day, we, we can start getting burned out on this stuff as well. It was, it, it, that was another thing. It was, I was trying to keep myself from getting burnt out on this. I was, because it will, even if you love the game, you do it every weekend, every single day. It will catch up to you and you realize, I need a little bit of a break. Yeah, especially with, again, you trial all the time. And that that's why you're in this this points chase. So let's jump on into this. Is You look at the points leader. When you start kind of figuring out how the points work and how you accrue points throughout the, the trial season, and then you start looking at the point leaderboard, obviously a few things stand out to you. A, like, you know, they, they have to win a lot, but B, they just have to trial a lot. Like, I mean, it, that's just right. kind of the name of the game. What what is it? What is the benefit to being the points leader through a trial season? Let's start there. So, just the points leader, you get a big, nice, fancy trophy at nationals in February. So that's always great. That I think you can get a jacket as well, a nice Carhartt jacket. But it's also the title of Dog of the Year that like kind of sets me. Like I could do without the trophy, but I just like having that title for him. Uh, and he's gotten it before. I just, I want to get it for him as many, as much as I can or do as much as I can for him. Since he is my first dog, I've been just trying to get everything I can for him. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah, I mean, you just you just want the accolade for your for your buddy essentially. So I mean, I right. I, I can get that. W- walk me through like when you decide I'm gonna go after this. I'm gonna get my buddy the dog of the year title. How much suck do you know that you have to? to take in for that? Like, is it, is this a, a labor of love or is this just like, no, nah, grit your teeth. We're going to do this. And, and, and hopefully we end up, end up on the right side of the chase here. So last year it was pretty much love. It was not <laughs> this year's tough. I admit this year is tough. Last year it wasn't as tough just because he had started out the year good from January to April he was consistent through then, and then throughout the fall, he just kicked it up a notch and just kept going. This year, it's been a little tough with spring. He was kind of he was hurt, so he wasn't running as good. Uh, this fall, he's picked it back a little bit up a little bit. It's just so you really. I try to decide in January if I'm going to try, and you really got to wait until the fall to see if you're going to try. Mm-hmm. So I'm always sort of trying to go for it, trying to push for that you know, the points or whatever at the start of the year. Uh, I can't remember where I started in spring, this spring, where I was at, but I think I've gained about 400 points this fall since the spring. This spring was not great for me. Uh, but really the fall is when most people try to yeah. decide whether they're going to go for it. You got to see where you're sitting at and where you got to run at. Like you, that's, uh, a lot of times you have to travel. You got to go where the dogs are. You got to go to big trials. You got to go. A lot of time you got to compete against the people that you're running against for dog of the year. Mm-hmm. And I mean, so you guys won it in 22, right? And and one thing I I don't think you mentioned it. Uh, if you do win the points leadership, you get an automatic buy. Right. And in, right. in, in the national open. So there, right. there is actually like a strategic advantage right. to winning this outside of just the accolades, which, you know, it would be cool to say, I have the dog of the year, but you got, you won this last year, right? We won the open last year and the doubles last year. And we got the amateur the year before and the doubles the year before. Yeah. So you, so, so you know that by putting in the time and the effort that, that yeah. you can be rewarded by it. Uh, but j- even with, a, a dog of that caliber, especially when you guys are kind of hitting and all, on all cylinders, like you said, the fall is is it, you you guys kind of end strong, but then pick up in the in the springtime. Just because you get that dog of the year and that title does not mean that you win the nationals, right? Like that is a completely separate event to right. where you just have to qualify for it. And then at the end of the day, it's just like every other trial is kind of like the best dog that weekend, the best team really that weekend right. can ultimately win and become the national champion. Right. And I think it's only happened like one time where the dog deer did win nationals. It's, it's a rarity, but it's not impossible either. So yeah, You know, I, last year I was kind of hoping, I was like, well, maybe this will be the number two dog that does it. But, you know, we never, we didn't get lucky enough for that. Yeah. How how have you fared in the nationals? Like where did you guys place last year in it? Do you remember? So last year was actually my first year in the open finals. We got fifth place. I had a two minute and three second run. And that was my fault because I decided to be real I didn't let him be sloppy as best what it was. I, I had come off the line. He slammed his first bird, shot that one. As soon as I pulled the trigger on that one, another came up, and I shot that one. And so instead of just throwing a golf ball for him and letting him go get that one, I brought him to heel and him sit down, and then I threw that golf ball for him. So that way he knew where the bird was. And that was probably five seconds right there that it would have placed me in third place, I believe, if I wouldn't have done that. But it was worth it, too, because it looked – Nice and fancy. <laughs> so you got you got points for making it pretty. So, but yeah. that that gives the listeners kind of a, a, a an idea of where you're at. To where a two minute and, and three second run is that what you said? Right. Out of a possible fifteen minute brace, two minute three seconds. That was not good enough 
to win the nationals that day. And, right. and, and so you came into fifth, fifth place, but that is just how fast it can go when you have these dogs right. and, and these handlers that know it. it. It's just, I mean, boom, 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 boom. It, it can really happen that fast. And so it's really interesting when you get out there and experience it to where it's just like, you know, I've had a couple runs to where it's just like Rachel's had good two out of three bird runs like multiple mm-hmm. times, but we haven't been able to piece it together. But there was one that first weekend to where we almost made it out of the field in like three minutes. But then right. I, I can't even remember what happened. That three minutes turns into like a 13 minute run to where it's just like, if you, if it's not, if it doesn't happen for you, the, the time scale can, can fall off pretty quick. If, if you're not right. careful, it, there's a lot of luck involved in it too. This game is, it, you can prepare as much as you want, but there is luck involved with it as well. Uh, that Nationals last year, I was unlucky on my first run. But he pointed, and I kicked around, kicked around, saw where the bird was, and I looked over to the left, and 15 yards away, I saw the bird walking around out in that there's this wide open grass. I was like, oh, it's all the way over there. So that cost me a little time. I had to, there was a fence going down the middle of that field between A and B field, and I had to shoot it over the fence then I had to send him over the fence and then I get him back, which he's, he actually did really well with it. As soon as I sent him over, he went straight to the bird and came straight back. And yeah. it just took us time. It costed us time just having to, you know, find the bird and, you know, get him back over the fence yeah. and everything. There, there is a lot of luck involved with it. Absolutely. You, you, you can't win this based on skill alone. In my opinion, you have no. to, ha- you have to have luck. The birds have to cooperate. The birds have to fall the way, you know, you, you, you need a lot of things, especially when you're talking about like a 10 minute uh, run. I mean, there's, right. there's not a lot of room for, for bad luck in that. So talk to me about the golf balls. You brought that up, you know, people listen they're like, why, why the heck do you have golf balls? Uh, <laughs> it, what, what are you using the golf balls for? And kind of talk to me like how many golf balls do you carry out there? You know, kind of talk to me about your whole golfing strategy in this game. You can use anything except for a live shell or I can't remember what all you can't throw. I know you cannot throw a live shell out in the field, but basically if the dog mismarks the bird when you shoot it, you can throw a golf ball or I've seen some people take PVC pipe with rocks in it to rattle. I've seen people throw those at, but the big thing is another thing you have, I work my dog on is getting his attention on a dog a bird. He hasn't marked that way. I can easily get his attention, throw the ball real quick. He knows where it's at, bring it back where you have some dogs that just run wild and they run in circles for five minutes for they'll actually listen to you. Yeah. Uh, Mostly it's just for mark bird, using mark birds. I usually take five with me in the field because, I mean, it's highly unlikely I'll use all five, but you just never know. Just in case, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and again, you know, somebody's sitting here like, well, why don't you just line them up and, and send them on a blind? And, and that's what I did the first weekend with Rachel. Bird fell down. Uh, she couldn't really pick up on it. She started venturing a little too far. I called her all the way back because once you shoot the bird, you can't take a step. Right. You, it will, you can, but then you're going to get a partial retrieve. You want the full retrieve points. And so I called her all the way back in. I lined her up, sent her on a blind. She got the bird and brought it back. But that was a lot of time. And so if you're in this to actually win, having golf balls or any of these little tools to just kind of throw it. If I, if I could have done that, especially, you know, I got a pretty good arm. I could, I could pinpoint it pretty close. I could have done that. And, uh, you could say that if you just put a handle on your dog and, and, you know, whoa and cast and stuff like that, exactly. you're, you're not getting graded on any of the obedience. Like if they ignore you by all means, like some people's dogs are pretty rough out there, but, uh, Everything is just it, it it it's an opportunity cost. Everything costs time. And so it's it's really like until you're in the moment doing this and and really trying to go as fast as you can, uh you, you really don't you don't see like the biggest pros and cons to some of these decisions, I guess, until you're right. in it. I don't know. And that's part of why you try to prepare for every situation you can think of. And that's one of them right there is a mismarked bird or something. Safety birds, mismarked birds, birds that won't fly. Uh, getting two at one time, which is, I mean, I guess like basically be a mismarked bird as well. But you try to prepare as much as you can for every scenario, best you can think of at least. 
Yeah. Again, you you talked about earlier that the biggest thing that you enjoy about this is is really kind of everything as a whole. You you really enjoy the social aspect of it, the competition, the camaraderie between the other people that you're competing with, but they're your friends, right? And and that's something right. that when when I was getting into this space, you know, I thought that hunt tests was what I wanted to do. And and don't get me wrong, like I, I still do them and and will uh, to some degree, but the reason why I never really went the trial route is I'm like, all right, I don't want to mix up my competitive nature into what I enjoy doing because I know competition can kind of bring out the worst in some people. It can bring out the best in some people, but it can bring out the worst in some. And so I was always hesitant to kind of put myself in that situation. And and that is something that since I've run, run a few trials and I've kind of attended UFTA is yes, it's a competition. Yes, there's a scoreboard. There is a winner and there is a last place. Everybody there to kind of circle back on something you said earlier, if you ask for help, they're going to help you. You have people from all over. And while everybody's there, they want to win. Everybody's still there wishing everybody good luck. And I don't, I don't say that in like, it's a fake, oh yeah, good luck. You know, hope you have a good run. Like I, I can't say that I've really gotten that feeling from anybody to where somebody's saying good luck, but they're really kind of secretly hoping that you fall flat on your face. Right. right. Like, like it, it truly does feel like everybody's there to win, but they want to do it in the right way to where they know I won this. And it wasn't just because everybody else sucked. It was because my dog earned it, right? Right. right. You always want to do it the right way and feel like everybody's dogs was, were good, but yours came out a little bit better. I mean, I say good luck to everybody whenever they come out of the blind. or Even if I'm coming out of the field and there's two guys in the blind, I try to say good luck if I can talk to them. I haven't seen any harsh feelings towards anybody, at least – in the blind or anything like that at a trial. Yeah. Everybody's pretty much talking. They're all friends. Everybody's buddied up. Another thing is, you know, being around everybody, there's a lot of people talking actual hunting, right? So like, you know, you go to certain dog events and, and different tests or, or trials and, it, and it's just like, that's, that's what they're there to do. Obviously you're going to talk to a lot of people talking about whatever organization or circuit they're involved in. That's why they're there. Right. But to varying degrees, do you come across people that are actually talking about wild bird hunting and trips? And and that's something that I noticed right off the bat here is you're surrounded by people that, yes, they're playing the game and they're playing the game to win. But the vast majority of people are wild bird hunters and going on trips. And this is something that as I've gotten to know you a little bit, you're you're not a wild bird hunter yet but you have plans on becoming one. Where does that kind of fall in your in your sights uh, when it compares to like preparing and, and competing at these high points and chasing the, the dog of the year and balancing that out to eventually getting out and learning the wild bird game? So to be honest, um, next year, this coming year, I think I'm going to slow down on trials and try to get more into wild bird hunting for the past two and a half years. I've won, I've heard all my buddies talking about wild bird hunting and the trips they go on and seeing on social media, all these pictures and all these videos, and it's always maybe want to go. So I'm going to start trying to push myself to at least go once a year, maybe twice a year, if I can to go wild bird hunting. Uh, not sure where I'm going yet. I'm yeah. going to figure something out, but I'd like to go. Is there something screaming at you that you want to try? Obviously, I want to try a pheasant just because I've never, I mean, never shot a pheasant. Yeah. That seems like the one everybody goes for. So that's one thing I want to try. I've talked to you before. I think I've told you. I don't think I'll like grouse hunting, but I'm <laughs> going to try it. I don't think I'll like it, but I'll try it. Um, I definitely want to hunt chucker and uh, partridge for sure. Yeah, I, I think you would get along. I mean, just knowing you a little bit, I don't know you that well, but we've been around each other a little bit. Obviously, I think the prairie birds uh, are going to be yeah. up your alley with what what you prefer, and whether that's sharp tail grouse or huns or or chucker right. up in the hills. But uh, yeah, man, it's it, it's just one of those like you have to make a decision on the weekends. Am I trialing or am I going to go hunting? And, and you and I have spoken to where like, that's what's kept me from years previously trying this out. I was always, 
I was always going to go with hunting. Like I, I couldn't sacrifice the hunting to trial. And then there's people such as yourself to where it's just like, man, th this is what I love to do so far. But it's interesting talking to so many people around these UFTA trials, how many people do both. And, uh, I, I know that that's when I first got into the dog world is that's, you don't hear that very often about at least not every bird dog trial circuit, right? Like some circuits, I guess, are, are a little bit more hunting focused, but it seems like some people it's just, it's just like they strictly trial and test. And then some people that hunt and that's what I, I really do appreciate, appreciate about UFTA is it seems like a lot of people do both. Yeah. That you have like all my buddies when they go on hunt, hunting trips, as soon as they come back, I'm asking them about how the trip went. And a lot of people do, especially if you're at a trial, you people from what I've seen, any of my buddies that come back from a trip, everybody's asking them how the trip went, pictures, videos, the, how dogs did everything. And that's, what's pushed me to want to go even more while bird hunting. Talk to me about the level of competition as we kind of kind of start wrapping this up a little bit. You know, you live and compete and, I, you know, I'm in Tennessee and, and so far I've only trialed in Kentucky so far. I haven't branched out and tried any other states or locations, but Kentucky has a lot of lead trialers in the organization. There, there's a high level of competition within the state. Do you think that the reason why you're so competitive and and you've been so driven to compete at a high level on this is because you're facing off against those guys on a week in week out basis. Does that make sense? Like, are you competing up to the level of competition and now you're, you're up there with them? Do you think that that had a big thing to do to where maybe if you were in another state to where you didn't have as many guys that are, are as serious about it, do you think that it would have bit you as, as quick as it did? I think the level of competition here definitely had a big part of it because there was a time where I didn't think I was, I wouldn't say necessarily not good enough, but I wasn't at the level they were. And then once I felt like they thought of me as somebody they were equal to, at least, it made me want to push harder and go deeper into trialing and bird dogs. Uh, it gave me more people to look up to as well. Who were some of the people that, that really helped you get going and, and kind of piece together and, and find your own footing on, on how you want to do this. Cause that's a balancing act in of itself to where a lot of people can tell you how they do things, but you kind of have to find the, your own approach, if you will. So my grandfather, obviously he helped me start out and a couple of my buddies, uh, my buddy Hardy Jaggers, he gave me somebody to look up to, honestly, it's made me want to, he's actually the one that made me kind of want to start, working with dogs and training more dogs that weren't mine, some other people's dogs. Another buddy of mine, Craig Carvey, he pushed me to basically fix my dog at some point. He helped me get him out of his little slump he was in for that mm -hmm. two-year period of whatever it was. But just a lot of people in UFA, they, they, they pushed me to come forward and be where I'm at now, pretty much. Yeah. Last question. We we didn't touch on this, but I'm really intrigued by the the doubles. And this is something that you you obviously had some success in last year. It to me, this looks like it might be the most fun if you can find the right partner to to right. take you up on it and, and something that you work on. Talk to me about the doubles. Like, to explain to the listeners the the setup of the doubles, and then what kind of makes a good doubles partner so the doubles is a 15 minute run just like your open single division but you have two dogs and two handlers and you're a team throughout the year i mean you have to run three times to qualify in the ufta for the qualify uh, for the nationals that is right qualify for the nationals uh you can obviously run more if you want to you if you run for the dog of the year or team of the year i guess you could say you're obviously going to run more than three times, I'd say. But you get six birds instead of three, and you have your 15 minutes to find them, and each dog gets an opportunity to back or honor. For every back or honor, you get five points, but you get one attempt per dog. So if my dog comes in, and how, how it works is your front dog has to stand still if the back dog moves before the front dog, it's it's not a good back. So 
if my dog comes in and he's solid, that's a good back. But if he starts creeping after I've called back, not good. And that's my only attempt I get with him. Now, this other dog can still attempt it with my dog. But that's the only chance I have with my dog. Mm -hmm. Uh, It can either be utter chaos or it can be the fastest pace thing you do in your life. Uh, Originally, I started doing it with my cousin. And I think we went for two or three years. And it just got to where I didn't think his dog was as much of a double dog. Some dogs are cut out for it and some that just don't run well with other dogs they don't compete with the other dog whereas mine if there's another dog in the field he's competing to find the birds and you kind of have to have that competition between two dogs that pushes both of them to go a little bit harder but you also have to find a common ground where they'll back each other and work well with each other yeah uh then i went with a buddy of mine ethan preston his dog his name's trooper and we did that for about a year and he ended up getting rid of the dog. Now I'm with my buddy Gabe Kessinger and his dog Clyde. And his dog is actually one of the dogs in the points race as well for amateur and open. And to be honest, I feel like a good doubles partner is somebody who's willing to work with you. We'll work dogs together, try to fix the issues that we do have and admit that we do have issues as well as, you know, ha- finding time to get together and like, some of the things we need to work on. His dog is good at it. My dog has gotten a little bit out of it. Is honoring or backing. My dog is, isn't as good as his dog at it. But they both find birds and they both work well for the most part in the field together. But I feel like it's just got to be somebody you can get along with and both of your dogs are going to work well together and you're willing to work together to fix any issues. Right. And are you allowed to woe your dog into a back? No, no, you're you're not allowed to woe your dog. You're not allowed to touch your dog, either one of them whatsoever. To me, the the doubles just sounds like it would just be fun. It just sounds like it'd be a blast as you and your buddy. I can also see a, a lot of breakups happening too. <laughs> I can see some buddies yeah. maybe having I've, some falling outs, but uh, I don't know. It just seems like a blast to me. No, oh, it is. It's it's fun, but it can also be it, it can be a little bit chaotic too at the same time. Yeah. There's like a, I think it was that trial, this last Cedar Creek trial we had, we were going and uh, me and my buddy Gabe were going and my dog was on point. So and another thing, how it works is one dog could find all six birds. And as long as one person shoots three and the other person shoots three, you can't shoot more than three. Each person cannot shoot more than three. I forgot I only had two birds. I don't know why I forgot. I only had, you got to keep track of how many birds you have. I forgot. <laughs> I don't know why. So my dog was on point over by him. I was like, shoot it, shoot it. And he's like, you got three? And I looked over at the judge. I was like, do I have three? He said, no, you got two. I was like, oh, <laughs> I guess I'll shoot it. <laughs> so Just brain farts, can, man. Yeah. And you, well, that's another thing, communication in the field. I forgot about that as well. Whenever I'm done, I try to yell out I'm done or if, or let him know where I'm at in the field, how many birds I have. If I didn't get a bird in a certain zone, that way, if he needs to, he can go back and get it if he has to. Yeah. So communication is a big part of doubles as well. And I'm assuming you, you, you have some doubles partners that have probably been doing this for, for freaking years. And they just have that shorthand in the field to where they don't even need to worry about the communication. They just kind of know what the other one's going to do. And, and stuff like that, it just sounds like, man, you, you find the right doubles partner. I think that that would just right. be a freaking blast. Right. Some people, they they just – they have a strategy where, like when my cousin and me, we started doing doubles. That was when my dog was running to the back of the field as hard as he could. So what my cousin would do, he could keep his dog in the front. He would get the two front birds. I would get the two back birds, and we just meet up in the middle and get the middle birds. There you go. And it worked for us for a while. And then I decided I'm not doing this anymore. I, I got tired of walking the back of the field. That was, I had some strong calves that year. <laughs> Getting your steps in. 
Oh yeah. Well, Laura, man, is is there anything else that you think that we should touch on before wrapping this up? It was a, it was a blast kind of getting to know you a little bit more and a little bit back on your on your backstory, but really ultimately just what it is that you enjoy about UFTA so much because, I mean, seriously, like, you know, I, I was at the Nationals last year, but then the first trial this year is like you're the first person there that I that I met, and it just seems like you're – if there's a trial within spitting distance, you're going to be at it. Yeah, well, as long as it's in Kentucky and I can get off work, yes, I'll, I'll be there. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, mainly just UFTA is good fun, good people, and good dogs. It's from what I've most I've gotten out of it for the 13 years I've been been in. Yeah, it's something that I can't see myself being out of. Yeah, well, awesome, man. Well, uh, you know, at the time we're recording this, the point leadership it has not uh, it has not been established, but by by the time this comes out, you know, guys, everybody stick with the outro if you want to know if Lauren uh, won dog of the year or not. And, uh, yeah, man, I appreciate your time and kind of just talking dogs and UFTA with us. Absolutely. It was good talking to you. Yep. All right, everybody. Hope you enjoyed that episode with Lauren Trout. This episode was presented by Standing Stone Supply, Onyx Hunt, Final Rise, and Upland Gun Company. You know, there's a couple common threads between the last two episodes, both with Kevin and Lauren, but I think that the main thing worth highlighting here is that while UFTA and, and trialing in general is a competitive nature, everybody's out there to try and win and better themselves and their dogs and their kennels and, and their lines, uh, both of them said that, that what keeps them coming back and, and their favorite part and what they enjoy the most about it is that are the friendships uh, around UFTA and, and going to the events and seeing their friends and, and then afterwards going and, and sharing a meal and, and having some drinks. And, and it, it's just really interesting when you kind of break it down to where a lot of people will say that they, they aren't interested in trying trials or anything of a competitive nature because they don't want to get bogged down into the, the actual competitive aspect. And uh, as I mentioned in one of the episodes, I can't remember which, that that was kind of a deterrent for myself as well as, you know, I'm a competitive guy by nature. I never really wanted to mix pleasure and, and what I enjoy about this world with the competitive aspect of it because I, I could see myself getting drawn into that a little bit too much. But then when I realized that I, I, I was getting into some of the hunt test stuff and I realized that behind the scenes, people are still people. They're still competitive by nature and they still want to be the best. And so what I realized by going to a number of trial events, not just UFTA and comparing it or contrasting that against my experiences in and around the hunt test is they're all the same people. The difference is the the trialers, they leave the competitive nature out there in the field because that is the proving ground. While the hunt test people, they'll just sit around the campfire and still talk about their dog is the best or or that they think that their dog could out compete or out hunt the other one. And so I, I don't know if honesty is is the right word. I guess accountable is the right word. And, and the way I look at it is is, you know, if you're going to sit there and claim your dog is the best, then go to an event or, or an organization to where you can actually prove that your dog is is the best. And if you're sitting here and you're saying, well, I don't care if people recognize my dog or myself as the best, then it's no big deal as long as you don't talk about it. But, you know, I've been around those campfires. I've been around the, the dinner tables after certain hunt tests or, or training days. And, uh, I hear the talk, you know, it's, it's there. And so, you know, I, I know a lot of people that are really fond of hunt tests and I appreciate them for what they are. Uh, you may not be personally the one talking trash to everybody else, but I, I know we've all heard it. it it's there. And so all I'm going to say is if, if you're around, uh, the hunt test or the dinner table sharing drinks and, and you're one of those people that say my dog's the best, well, there, there's a place to prove that. And, uh, that's in the trial field, not the hunt test field. And so, uh, I enjoy hunt tests and, and, and grading your dogs against the standard as much as the next person. But when it comes to the actual people, uh, I don't really see any difference between trialers and testers other than the trialers that they're just honest with each other and they hold each other accountable. There's not a lot of trash talking going on behind the scenes or, or after runs or, or whatever, because they all know that eventually 
your dogs are going to have to step foot on that ground and they're going to have to prove themselves. And so you have to back up what you claim. Uh, in terms of the actual points chase, you know, what kind of capped this off and, and as both, uh, Lauren and Kevin mentioned on their episodes, uh, Gabe Kessinger was amongst the, the race and, and he had originally wasn't when I started talking to both Lauren and, and Kevin about this idea. So it, you know, if he was up in the top three or at least, uh, as competitive as he had was as they closed out the race, I probably would have included him in, in some way, shape, or form, or maybe just done a, a full round table with all three of them or, or something like that. But either way, the uh, the points race for 2023 is now done, and Kevin actually won out. Lauren was actually the leader for, for the majority of the time. It looked like he was going to come away with it. But Kevin, he, he really just kind of – everything aligned in that last weekend. You know, he texted me and said – I, th I think he had to go to a, a specific trial. I think it may have been in Illinois. Uh, it was either Kentucky or Illinois. I can't remember. And then he had to place or do really well on that one. And then he had to shoot up to another trial in Ohio and win that one to come out ahead on the points chase. And he did that. And so uh, I know – just getting to know guys like Lauren and Kevin, I don't know Gabe as as well as the other guys uh, so far, but I know at least for those two, uh, this really matters to them. And you know, you you heard why they do it. It's 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 more than just uh, getting the title for your dog. You know, you get the bragging rights, you get that that intrinsic uh, reward of just accomplishing something that you and your dogs set out to to accomplish but you also you know you get you do get the trophy that you know you can take pride in that because that's that's what you earned with your dog but then you also get the buy into the uh into the nationals the final round of the nationals which is huge and and as as lauren really highlighted i think there's only been one dog that has won the the points leader as well as the national event so it's it's one of those, the Nationals is a very challenging thing. You have to place into the finals, then you have to go and compete into the finals and win that one. And so any dog can win, any any handler can win with the right luck and the right right scenarios on their side. But uh, as, as I, as I kind of get deeper into this game, into UFTA specifically, but I'm also not opposed to, to trying other uh, trials types and, and maybe even just walking trials or, or whatever, uh, it's it's a lot of fun and it's a completely different world. So if, you, if you're on the fence about trying something new, if you're maybe you're just hunting and you want to kind of dip your toe into something that extends that hunting season or gives you something uh, to do outside of hunting season – um, even, even if it's just in terms of training, it gives you a clear directive or, or a goal to, to strive for during the off season, kind of gives you a sense of direction Then I, I would highly encourage you checking out, you know, an organization such as UFTA. Uh, it's a lot of fun, good people, as you heard from these two this week, uh, it, it's worth your time. So, uh, with all that being said, I'm going to wrap this up. I know, uh, this, this was the first week of the new year. Next week is going to be kind of more of a, uh, 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 get out there and do it, you know, go go uh, accomplish something new or, or get outside of your comfort zone type of episode. So uh, we'll, we'll kind of save the new year talk for that. But I hope everybody had some safe holidays, uh, brought in the new year uh, the correct way and, and uh, you know, it just getting off to a good start. Hope everybody's enjoying it. If you haven't already, hit one of the uh, links in the show notes that, you know, whether that's YouTube or social media or Patreon, you know, follow us on something. Uh, we have a lot of big plans for 2024. And, uh, you know, thanks to everybody that's hit play, downloaded, shared anything, signed up for Patreon, anything in 2023. Uh, I'm only looking forward to taking this to the next level in 2024. Hope you have a great day. Thanks for joining us again, as always. 